All right, I will, uh, I'll get going and just introduce Pastor Paul again. We, uh, as Elder Board, we uh, asked Paul, we gave him like a list of like 10 questions that were kind of on our minds, thoughts that we had that we think that some of our folks are asking. And he's going to try to do his best to try to speak to those and anything else that he can speak to as well. And if we have time afterwards, we'll let uh, some little bit of question and answer if we can make that happen too. So I'll be quiet and it's all yours. All right. Well, good morning again. Uh, if I speak to anything I want, you said? No, I gave you those 10 questions. Oh, okay. So I was going to say, I think the Vikings need a defensive back, so I think is what we go for in the draft. Um, yeah, uh, Mark and the, the, your elder board gave me uh, nine or, or 10 questions, and I want to make sure that I'm speaking to things that are relevant for you or if you have clarification. I prefer this to be more interactive as necessary, so please just raise your hand or something if I say something you want further clarification on. I have, uh, I have been in my role for six and a half months now, and so honestly, I feel kind of like the uh, infant uh, that I was talking about, the infant president. I, I, <laughs> there's, there's much that I'm learning, and I've kind of adopted. Uh, there's, I, I mean, I'm a sports guy, kind of like Mark. There's a sports writer. I forget. I don't know if it's uh, Peter uh, King or whatever, but he's, there's someone that's got a column called uh, Things I Think I Think. And so I've developed a little talk uh, that I s say uh, 10 things I think I think I think, and, and then I'd like to know what you think about what I think I think. And, uh, uh, but it's just kind of in a little non-committal, I guess, in the sense these, these are passions that I'm feeling, but I'm looking really for kind of the feedback from, from the body to uh, affirm directions uh, that we're going. The questions pointed out to me were uh, some in that direction of, of uh, just kind of vision and heart things that I come into this uh, position with, so I'll speak to some of them. Uh, but again, if, uh, if there's directions you want to steer this, uh, please, please do so. So first of all, Mark, one of the things that uh, you guys uh, asked me was uh, just kind of the process of what it, what it will be like to be in a process of pastoral call. And I want to say that I, I, uh, I feel for you and with you having been on both the sending and the receiving and the going end of being a pa pastoral transition is, is stretching uh, on, on a church. Uh, it's the kind of stretch that, uh, that hopefully we give ourselves to, we, we grow through, but it's, uh, it's a testing time. But I think it's a very critical uh, a, a time. So I, uh, in terms of timetable, I think uh, the elders had mentioned, you know, we hope that we're not in a long, lengthy process with this. What's a typical timetable uh, for that? I, I have not been in this role long enough to speak with authority from president, just from observation. I think the timetable of your pastoral search and call process really is going to deeply uh, be dependent on three uh, kind of variables. And the first one is really your own readiness uh, for this. I think when a church is going through pastoral transition, it's really important to not just say, boy, our pastor's leaving, and he's a good one. You know, you've got a good one in Mark. You're losing a good one in, in Ed. First of all, I would say I think the healthiest attitude that Word of Life could adopt in this is not that you're losing a pastor, but that you're sending a missionary. You know, God chooses and calls and reappropriates and sends his people around, and we question timings uh, of things. I, uh, I mentioned a couple of you and asked you to pray for my, my father-in-law, Kerm, is really one of my best friends. He's had pancreatic and liver cancer for about two and a half years, and he was supposed to be gone two years ago, and uh, every month is a, a blessing. He was just taken off to the emergency room last night, and uh, his common bile duct is where the central tumor is. And, I, you know, the whole family just perpetually asks, God, this, this timing uh, isn't right. One of Ed's good friends down in, in Florida, uh, T.J. Turner, maybe you heard about the young uh, elder there, 39 years of age. I was involved in his ordination. I officiated his ordination four weeks or five weeks before this 39-year-old father of three young children drops dead from a major aneurysm. And it's, you know, we have a hard time not, question, you know, not questioning God's timing with things at the same time, we know that we're called to entrust ourselves to God. So in the middle of this transition, I would, uh, I'd say I will pray for you and hope that you can choose to an ad adopt a mentality that says, God, we trust you in this transition. 
This feels like uh, a departure. It is a departure, but we will embrace it as something that you are allowing, and we will send Ed rather than him having to leave. There's kind of a nuanced difference between someone that leaves and someone that is sent, and as God gives you grace, I think that'd be good. I also think in this timing then, that, that self-awareness of where it is you believe Word of Life is going, needs to go, and what pastor type will help you go in the direction of the ministry that ha you have. The more focused you are in sensing where you want to go in, the mis in your mission is going to help you look for the pastor that meets that profile. I've read the profile that your elder board has put together and I'm pretty impressed by it. A lot of thought has gone into that and in saying this is where we feel we're at and this is where we want to go. So I feel like you've done some good assessment already. There is something that the, our regional pastors uh, uh, team have called the Church Health Survey that I think your leadership team could choose to do too. It's just the time, just kind of poking, asking questions about you to, just to be more self-aware of the conditions in your church and the directions you want to go. You may have already you know, informally done that. But I think the first thing then is dependent upon your own readiness to know yourselves, what your needs are, and what kind of pastor you're looking for. The second th thing in terms of the pace of getting a pastor, I think has a lot to do with the time of year. Most pastors, especially if it's a pastor with kids still at home, are only going to be significantly, uh, largely ready to move during the summer months. You know, maybe after the semester break at Christmas is a second time but it's very hard for a pastor with children to move right in the middle of a school term. And so if the speed, if desire to move quickly is part of the priority for Word of Life, I would say candidating potential pastors between now and the end of May is pretty important so that if you do feel that you're in a place to issue a call, that that pastor can consider it and if, if led to accept, can give at least two months, if not three months, notice to the church where they're currently serving in order for that transition to occur by the end of the summer or beginning of the fall. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible for a pastor to start in October or November, uh, but if they're not an empty nester, that is an, that is an added thing. So I would say you're, you're at an okay place, but I would say if you really want someone by this fall, you should be moving with, with due uh, efficiency in candidating people uh, prior to the end of the school year. Make sense? Yeah. I don't think you make the wrong decision, you know, speed it in order to do that, but that, that is something that certainly impacts the pace. And, and the third thing uh, is just, you know, we trust that the Holy Spirit already knows who your next lead pastor is going to be, is already readying that pastor readying his church, readying this church uh, for it. And so, you know, you, you can't avoid the obvious of saying praying the Holy Spirit to ready this church, that church, and that man is, 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 uh, is right at the heart of what you should be doing. So uh, those, those are three things that just came to mind in terms of a process. Uh, our, our congregations are, are autonomous. Uh, my position in the denomination serve in an advisory role. When I mentioned this morning that my position is largely relationship and influence, it really is. There, there are only two significant points of a really kind of significant accountability that, that I and the Lutheran Brethren have with, with you. And one is, with our statement of faith, our congregations are held in check in a family by a common statement of faith that you have embraced. And that's really the only thing with the congregation to the Church of Lutheran Brethren. We've agreed on a statement of faith. The other thing <clears throat> is with our pastors, we have their ordination and something called the Minister of the Gospel Handbook that really is a signed covenant that says this is how we operate as Lutheran Brethren pastors. So uh, ordination isn't meant to be a hatchet held over the head of our pastors. It's really meant to be a fraternal kind of bond where we say, we know you and you know us, and we have this link. But it includes that pastor agreeing to the statement of faith and operating under these conditions in the ministry of the gospel handbook. It's just kind of a health quotient kind of thing. After that, there's great autonomy that, that your uh, a church uh, church has. Part of that minister gospel handbook is, as a member congregation, is 
that you will call pastors who are on our roster uh, abiding by that minister of the gospel handbook. Any, any uh, specific questions on the call process you'd like to ask me? Every two weeks, our regional pastors meet for about a three-hour video conference. <clears throat> we go over every church that has pastoral openings or pending openings and something we call an open-to-call list, which is a list of pastors who we know are in transition and are available. And uh, we have talked about you, and we have talked about those people a, a little bit, and I've talked with your elder board initially, and one of the questions a lot of churches ask, especially a, a, you know, a medium sized church like yours with hunger and vision to grow larger in, in your ministry is are we confined to those pe people whose names are on the open to call list and the technical answer is no uh, you can contact anybody any pastor on our roster that you want uh, a, a lot of our pastors will say no i'm not open to call and uh, others will say you know what i'm always open to call even though my name is on the list just if god if god wills i'm be willing to, to, to say yes. When I moved from, you know, Fort Collins to uh, uh, Fullerton, California, they called. I said, no, I'm not. Well, will you come out and visit us and just have a conversation? I said, well, I'm not open to call. And Morris Wordall was the guy. He said, well, it's February, and we've got free tickets to Disneyland. Will you come out? <laughs> I said, I think I hear the Lord calling. We weren't open, we weren't open to call. But sometimes pastors just, you know, I mean, if, if we are honest before God, we, have, we kind of have to say we're always open to call. One, one of your elders said, well, how about you? I, you know, yourself and Glenn. Sure, you know, and that's, uh, that's we, we are the Lord's. So any questions on the call process? After losing myself off my notes and preaching for 40 minutes today, I wouldn't be on your call list. Okay, let's, uh, let's go, go on. One of the first uh, questions, uh, uh, topics that I, I don't know if Mark was the one that, uh, Pastor Mark, the one that kind of called this and sent this on, was just a question, please describe yourself on a personal and professional level. And, and you probably already gained some Im impressions from that. My wife's name is, is B. Uh, her given name's Billy Joe. Uh, it's her dad, Kerm, who's, uh, I'd ask you to pray for his situation. She was in my youth group when I was a youth director in Billings, Montana. I was 19 and she was 14 and there was absolutely nothing romantic going on at that time. <laughs> but when I was 26 and she was 22, my eyes realized that my lifelong, not lifelong, my longtime friend, little sister, had grown up into something else. And, and uh, we have one of those amusing stories where when she was in college and I was in seminary, we went out and ate once a week. We talked theology and life. She did her, my laundry for me in exchange for me taking her out to, to eat. She was, we realized that we never officially dated, but we'd probably been dating in a way of not knowing we were dating for several years, and it was one of the m most healthy things because it was without all the head games of the traditional dating uh, kind of thing. We, we have five kids. They were all born in California. Gabe is 22, uh, just graduated from college. I, I, I don't. I don't want this to sound sacrilegious, but we think we, we sometimes call him bad Jesus just because he, we think he could be in any passion play. He just looks, through, he's got the hair down to, to here and the full beard, and, and he's very musical, very, uh, he'll probably make a great worship leader, youth uh, kind of guy. He's not looking in a ministry direction now. He's in a couple of bands, and he works with college ministry over at, in Eau Claire, but he has no idea what he wants to do with his life. He graduated with a graphic art and web design degree, and and photography, three disciplines together, and he graduated, and he turned to me and said, Dad, I figured out three things I don't want to do. Okay, great. Okay. How many degrees are you going to need before you know what you want to do? <laughs> Gracia is a junior. She's a <clears throat> ball of energy. She's 5'10", has got a cannon of, a, of an arm, and uh, uh, will take on anybody, anything in life. She's a college softball player, but she's rehabbing a shoulder uh, surgery right now. Uh, she leads an Athletes in Action uh, campus group on her softball team and would like to do that as full-time ministry after college. Uh, I could also see her in parish ministry in different ways. Uh, she, she's, a, she's a fire plug. Nick is <coughs> 19, <coughs> college uh, freshman, somehow 5'9 and 5'5. Five five. My wife and I produce 6'3. I don't quite know how that, you know, what happened. But, Great young guy. He is in the band with his older brother. All, all of our kids are very musical. Karina's a junior at Hillcrest. Uh, she just 
texted me last night and said, Dad, you're going to be home for my concert this afternoon, and uh, so we'll see. She's, uh, she's my princess, and then my youngest is Nate. He's 15 and he's a sophomore at Hillcrest, and he's a brainiac, one of these kids that knows two years more than he ought to know and lets you know that he knows it. So, uh, uh, so personally, um, I am more introverted than people assume. Uh, I recharge by uh, being with one or two good friends on a golf course or on a beach uh, or reading a book. Uh, I like people. I'm not severely introverted, but I think in the recharge, I, I probably, I am more than people assume that I am just because of upfront roles that I've had. Uh, but I, I am one of the pastors who is in the minority who have been blessed by having really close friends in ministry. Stati statistics say that 70% of American pastors say they don't have one close personal friend, and, and ministry can be isolating, and uh, I know about, you know, Mark and Ed, I think highly uh, of them, but ministry is hard to be close to people. I, I am one who's been really blessed by having really good friends uh, in the ministry, a close core of brothers, and uh, they, have, they have kept me. Uh, about my first week in office this fall, uh, I left early one day, and on a short trip, I uh, got an email from my secretary saying, everything went fine at the end of the day except for the snake in your office. I said, <laughs> snake? I was texting back, what in, the, what in the world? And I brought in these palms from uh, Ikea because I wanted green in my office. I got rid of the conference table, brought in soft chairs. I, I have a conference room next door. I don't want a second conference room. I wanted a place that oozed relationships. I wanted plants and, and this. And I think a snake was hidden down one of the pots and crawled out. <laughs> And, uh, or it could be, you know, we're building this whole new seminary building on the back of the denominational building. We're very excited about. You know, if, if any of you have been down through the seminary building, it's down the hill, kind of tucked down underneath Hillcrest. You hardly see the building. And sometimes those 300 yards from the denominational headquarters to the, to the seminary could be 300 miles. You can go through seminary and never meet the, the department heads, uh, the president, and, and this is going to open up water cooler talk opportunity for our our young seminarians, our, our, our new pastors to really know more intimately the, the leadership of the CLB. I'm excited about that. We disturbed ground there. Maybe the snake came out. At any rate, snake in the middle of my floor. Secretary doesn't like, uh, administrative assistant Kay doesn't like snake. She screams. Larry Bethel runs in, who's this outdoor guy, picks it up. And now just gather the imagery of this, knowing that the denominational headquarters. Picks up the snake. It's on carpet. So he takes it to the break room, tile floor and he crushes its skull with his heel. Okay, Isaiah. <laughs> and, uh, and so at the first church I was at uh, Triumph after this, he said, I'm going to pray for you. And I said, you know, just pray that there's not another snake in the president's office. <laughs> and that's, that is funny, but I mean it. I, I recognize that whenever you're in leadership, you're vulnerable. And uh, the last thing I want to do is shame uh, the name of our, our Lord, and I, I, I think anybody who's in ministry uh, wears a, a target, and uh, so pray that there's not another snake uh, in the president's office. Um, I, uh, on professional level, uh, I, I have kind of a diverse experience. I grew up as a farm boy in northern Minnesota. I've been a youth pastor. Uh, I've been a church planter in Colorado. Uh, pastored a restart church in middle of 10 million people in, in the greater metropolitan L.A. area and then been lead pastor at one of our larger churches with the larger staff. And, I, and I, I'm not boasting there. I am grateful in this position that I feel like God has given me a diversity of experiences to walk into a diversity of churches. And I don't, every church is different, but at least feel like, you know, I've, you know, I've tasted a little bit of what it's been like to be in these uh, different kinds of churches. I'm grateful for that. Uh, I have a teaching degree in history. I was going to be a history uh, a teacher before a church in Billings that I was youth pastor at simultaneously uh, coaxed me into seminary, made me believe uh, kind of uh, against my own will that God could use somebody like me in ministry. Um, I got my <clears throat> Master of Divinity from our seminary. Uh, I entered a doctoral program at Fuller Seminary and uh, did all my classwork. I have all of my classes done for my doctorate, but <clears throat> I didn't finish my dissertation. I, I had a sabbatical in which to write my dissertation, and I was very tired. It was about seven years ago, and I had kind of a Mary Martha moment where my wife and I talked, and 
realized that I needed to choose the merry route, that my wife and my kids and I needed rest more than I needed letters. And uh, I've never looked back, and I'm totally fine with it. I had a rich education uh, uh, there. Uh, I thought I was going to teach for a while, and uh, I'm, I'm okay with that, but that's, that's kind of my professional background. Uh, I have... Uh, I have personal passion in, have, I think it goes all the way back to being youth ministry. When I meet someone who I knew when they were young in the Lord and see that they have gone on with the Lord and grown in ministry or in faith, it charges me like nothing else, not because I take credit for it, just the pleasure of seeing someone who has gotten the gospel and goes on with it and they deepen uh, in it. I, <clears throat> that, that fuels my fire incredibly is to see young people grow up and go on in the gospel, especially as they're led into living in the freedom of the gospel. Any questions or comments there? I'll move on to the next question. The, the second question that your uh, elders gave me is, please describe the role of the regional pastor. <clears throat> Any comments uh, you can make about the future of it? Uh, one of the things I had back in my notes about your call process is one of the things we can offer you is the ministry of the regional pastor Whoops, except we don't have a central regional pastor uh, right now. Joel Nordfett <clears throat> retired right at the new year, and we've been in a search process for one. And uh, it's, it'll be my first major appointment in this new office. It's for me to recommend to the council of directors, and, and they appoint, but I'm the one that does the homework on it. And so I have been studying the regional pastor ministry uh, heavy for six months. I want to understand what the regional pastors have been doing, what their charter was, what our Constitution said that the regional pastors were to do, and then understand the team of people we already have. Because one of the things that became clear to me <clears throat> is that our regional pastors are not five independent contractors. We have five regions in the Church of the Lutheran Brethren. One is Canada, and then we have an eastern region, a central region that, that you are in, and a western region, which are the Dakotas, Montana, Colorado, and then a Pacific region, which is a challenge because it includes the Pacific Northwest and the Pacific Southwest, but it's, it's one, one region. And uh, they really operate as a team. They have a different gift mix, and so the opportunity to introduce someone into the team with their gift mix is critical. And I can't name the name yet, but I, am, I have come down to one name that I am settled on, that I have been in dialogue with, that I have <clears throat> done the disc profile and the references, and I will be making a, a recommendation to our Council of Directors. Uh, probably next week with that, and then they'll have to decide if they need to get together face-to-face -to -face or if we can have a video conference for that. My goal is to have a central regional pastor in place by the end of the summer. Um, part of uh, the question, though, is the role of the regional pastor. Um, largely, when you look at the job description of the regional pastor in our new constitution, it's two-phased. One is to provide soul care for our pastors. You can't have a healthy church unless you have a healthy pastor. Even if you have a healthy pastor, it doesn't guarantee it, but you won't have a healthy church if you don't have a healthy pastor. And the regional pastor's first role is to come alongside our pastors and their families and know them, have their trust, and be in a pastoral, a pastor to pastor. Kind of goes back to that thing of a lot of pastors don't have a friend. It's an isolating position. And so the regional pastor is meant really to be a shepherd of shepherds. Uh, that still is a big task. In the central region, how many, Mark, do you know, it was 30, 32, 35? So it's hard. They're not getting around. So underneath that, we also have vision for clusters or kind of peer uh, shepherding that goes on. We still have to develop that more where pastors are kind of taking care of each other under the guidance of the regional pastor. The second part of the regional pastor role, though, is to be a catalyst for mission, working with church leadership, with elder boards, trustee boards, and clusters of congregations for the advancement of missions. So your regional pastor should be knowing you and knowing your church culture and saying, what do, how can I help you to advance the gospel in Lesur in this area? How can we work together with other congregations in the area to send missionaries, international missionaries, to plant churches? And uh, the regional pastors so far have majored on the first one of soul care for the pastor and we're growing into the second one, and one of my personal goals and my role is to bring that into greater balance. Um, one thing that I think I've learned about the regional pastor <clears throat> ministry is 
Um, we're sinners, you know. Leaders are sinners. Elders are sinners. Church, we wouldn't have churches, would we, if we weren't sinners, right? And so there's always going to come times in churches where there's some stresses and things that have got to be worked out. And, uh, and regional pastors get called into mediating roles sometimes. Not often, but sometimes in difficult situations. And I think that's appropriate in mild mediation. But in, there have been a few cases of harder mediation where I think we've done wrong by having our regional pastor <clears throat> mediate. Because on the one hand, they've been doing the soul care for the pastor. On the other hand, they're gaining... Uh, the knowledge and relationship with the church leadership and for that person to then be the mediator between the two most mediations you really need someone that's quite neutral and unknown to both uh, parties and so we're going to make some changes that way in in the kind of the rare cases where we have a hard mediation maybe use a regional pastor from the you know the opposite coast uh, or, or someone even outside of our body um, any questions about the regional pastor ministry that I bring up It's our easy audience. Confirmation students are just dying on the vine here. When is this guy going to stop talking? We're going to talk all day. Uh, if you can speak to your hopes for the future of the CLBA. Um, yes, I can. Uh, I feel like I am on a mission for the church to know itself better than it knows itself and to regain a sense of morale and confidence. Uh, I mentioned a little bit in the sermon, I think local church ministry, we can get pretty isolated and all we're really aware about is kind of what's happening in our own bubble and we've got all we can do to have the energy to run our midweek program and our Sunday worship service and take care and shepherd our, our, our own and that's vitally important. But I think it's really important that we see ourselves in the larger uh, a scope of things uh, as well. And, and I, uh, whether you feel it or, or not, the theology of the Church of Lutheran Brethren and our emphasis, our mission emphasis, we have a Lutheran theology. We're part of a historic Reformation Lutheran theology, which at its purest leads people to know that not only are they saved fully by grace, God does all of the saving for us. Kind of a little bit what I was talking about here. But not only are we saved by grace, we live by grace also. And so we're sanctified, motivated by gratitude of the gospel, not by moralism. And so all of our sermons, all of our teachings, grace is the final word. Grace is what motivates us to holy living. Grace is what motivates stewardship. Grace is what motivates mission. We're not, we're not kind of obligated in, into this. And there's a lot of evangelical Christianity that has moved into more of a moralistic realm. And there's a lot of Lutheranism that's moved into uh, uh, an, an area that I think is apart from, has kind of given up scriptural authority. And, and some churches are leaving mainstream Lutheran and other mainline churches, and we attach it to an issue, uh, you know, I, I, I'll just go you know, right at it. The hotbed issue in mainstream Lutheranism is ordination of, of homosexual pastors. And so you have churches leaving mainstream Lutheranism because of that issue. And, and uh, I hope you'll hear, hear the second part of my sentence. I don't think that's why they're leaving. I think that's just a reflection of a deeper issue that happened 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And it was the, the reason is if you give up the dependence upon and belief in the absolute authority of Scripture, you will arrive at a number of places that after a while the water gets hot enough and the frog in the kettle starts to go, this, this isn't right. This isn't what we, what we believe. And, and so I think the primary issue in a lot of mainline Christianity has been the authority of Scripture. And the struggle in evangelical Christianity has been that inside all of us is a moral legalist that wants to believe that we reach that, you know, that, we're, that God is pleased with us when even after we're saved, we work our way into good graces with God by having our devotions every morning, by tithing 15% rather than 20 dot, dot, dot. So what I'm, my, my great wonder and vision is that both within mainline Christianity and Lutheranism and in evangelicalism, I think we've got a wonderful gift to share. And I say that not arrogantly. I feel like we are in a position that we can bless the greater church, we have something to share with Lutheranism. 
We have something to share with evangelicalism. We have something to share with a lost world. But we want to do it from a humble place where we say we not only have something, a precious gift to share, we have something to learn, too. And so part of my, my hopes for the future of the CLBA is that while we want to guard our theology, we don't want to be isolated. I think we need to be out in the fray of, uh, of life and Christian life. Uh, you know, part of being down at the Liberate Conference is an expression of my desire. I, I think there's some dangers of, you know, do we, you know, do we... Uh, cave in and move some directions we're not well we've got to know and own our theology well but I, I do not have the vision for us to be our own little protected box and nobody kind of knows who we are I, I think so much we have a gift to share we've got to be out there and we have to humbly say you know what? we have something to learn from these people they're doing some things well we have something to learn from these and integrate it into our, our theology um, when I was a younger pastor <clears throat> in California in one day I had two funerals uh, one for probably the greatest evangelist that ever has been in Lutheran Brethren circles, a guy named Rosenius Norheim. Have any of you ever heard that, that name before? Rosenius Norheim was this famed old radio preacher, probably had led tens of thousands of people to the Lord by radio ministry and tent meetings back in the day. <clears throat> uh, his funeral was in Pasadena, California, and I went up to his funeral later in the day. Earlier in the day, I had the funeral of a little girl named Davina Bassnett, who had a degenerative brain disease, died at 10 years old, never spoke a word, never developed past just infant abilities. She was baptized as an infant when she was five, when her family came to church. She was never going to intellectually, cognitively grow past that. Rosenius Norheim, at the end of his life, got dementia, very, very bad dementia, and was saying things that were just not in keeping with who he was, and, and it it struck me so powerfully on that day as I went from Davina's funeral to Rosenia's funeral that in effect they were the same on that day. And in heaven they were the same and I found myself being so grateful to be part of a faith movement and my only expression I have for it, I'd like to write on it someday, is that we have a theology that's thick at the edges. That God's grace can cover you all the way down here when you're an infant or you're a, a little girl like Davina God can save you and give you saving grace when you're at that beginning of, of life. And way over here, when maybe a lot of things have left you and your mind is gone, that faith runs deeper than that, that you don't have to lose your faith when you lose your mind, that we don't have this, this human bell curve of you know, qualification, that when you get to this level of maturity or sprightness or whatever, you can be saved. And we have this theology that's just thick at the edges and we can rest knowing that both Divina on the one hand and Rosenius on the other equally are child, children of God because of God's saving grace to them, which as, as a little child they received. And as they are cognitive, they are, their faith is as cognitive as they are. Um, so, uh, we are... Uh, there are some things that I, w I would like to... Uh, uh, see us move in understanding on, and one of them is I think we have to admit that as a church body, uh, as, as just Christianity in our country, we're kind of at the place where Europe was 30 years ago, and, and that is uh, post-Christendom. The church is no longer uh, at the heart of the community like maybe it was 50 years ago. Um, what you're doing here on Sunday morning uh, Evangelism used to be built around trying to get people who had grown up in the church or maybe born into the church back to the church later in life. And there's still people like that out in Lesur and beyond. But increasingly, people who are out there are pagans. They were never raised in the church. They have nothing to come back to because they weren't there in the first place. And the church is not at the heart of culture anymore. In American life, we're off here on the fringe, on the periphery, and I think we have to relearn what it is to be a missionary people from the fringe. I think that means that what you're doing inside the walls of the church on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, remains very important. The preaching of the word, the teaching, the discipling of children and adults is very important. But increasingly important becomes how the church, how word of life exists outside the walls of the church. Some of that is personal witness, but I think some of it is the full-orbed expression of the church, our vertical dimension 
of salvation, worship, discipleship with the Lord, our internal dimension of body life, of how we use our spiritual gifts to care for each other, and an external dimension of how we do mission, both in word and deed, we have to be the church outside of the bricks in a better, more obvious way than just inside the bricks because the lost world is not coming to see us anymore inside the bricks. We have to be better at being the church outside the bricks. Small groups have always been important. I would just say if you have small groups in your church, uh, some, some of us don't like the language of it because maybe it's fraught with things of emergent church. It's not for me at all. Uh, some churches talk about missional communities, and it's a big, broad term. Uh, I'm not pressing you toward that. All I'm saying is if you have small groups that meet outside the church, I think they have to learn to be full-orbed expressions of the church. They're not just Bible studies for the saints. They are places where people care for one another. They are places out of which mission happens in neighborhoods or schools or in individual lives. They are the full representation of the church outside the walls of the church. Does, does that make sense? I think that's a huge challenge for us. And you, and you know what? If we're honest, I, I don't know about you, but I've spent 30 years parish pastor. It can sometimes get that we spend 80 to 90% of our energies getting ready for one hour on Sunday morning. This is a really important hour. But if it's true that we're moving into post-Christendom where the church has got to be the church out there as well as here, I think we've got to make some judgment calls as to how we expend our energy and our time and our money and our friendships. Um, It's a challenge for us right now in post-Christendom. I hope and pray that it will really be the refinement of the church and it will lead a new day of mission where we really see that the mission of the church. In the New Testament, the the biblical word for preaching, proclamation of the gospel is caruso. And what we do up here, what, what Mark and Ed and I and others do is caruso. It's proclamation of the gospel. It's great. It's gotta happen, keep doing it. But most of the uses of caruso in the New Testament infers, at least in part, an unbelieving audience. And if increasingly unbelievers are not going to come to our worship gathering and be preached to, how is the ministry of preaching, how is the caruso, the proclamation of the gospel, going to happen to unbelievers if they're not coming to our gatherings? We have to find ways to proclaim the gospel of Christ. And I don't mean street corner evangelism, though maybe that's what God will lead Word of Life into, but other ways in which in our, in our schools, you guys have caruso, you need to be bearers, proclaimers of the gospel in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our extended family. And I don't think it means preaching at people. It's that the gospel lives in our actions, in our words, in our groups. Uh, But if we're dependent only upon our worship gatherings for preaching the gospel, I think we're going to find that our our movement is going to shrivel. Um, How am I doing for time, Mark? One's quitting time. Okay. That's definite. There's a, a book I might recommend to you. It's not a new book, but it's one of the books that I, I really appreciated reading when I was uh, at Fuller Seminary uh, by a guy named George Hunter III called The Celtic Way of Evangelism. It's a little rough because he talks about Irish culture and he uses Irish words and expressions uh, in there. But the thing that fascinates me about it is it talks about St. Patrick's um, methodology of reaching the pagan Celts in Britain, and it was the anti-Roman way. The Roman Catholic Church came into a pagan culture, and they built these Gothic cathedrals, and they extracted people out of their pagan culture, and they put them in, in, in monastic communities and really removed them from that. St. Patrick was totally the opposite. He came and he built these little sub-communities right on the edge of the community, and they were, they were communities with open walls of hospitality, arts, food, culture, uh, and the gospel integrated there, and, and people were just kind of invited in, and the church thrived. The pagan Celts came to, to know the Lord in droves until it became too threatening to the, the overarching church, the Roman church, and they came and essentially shut them down. Um, and it's a book that really says in that kind of time, we, we need to learn more from Patrick than we do from the, you know, kind of like the when in Rome, do as Rome, the other strategy was even when you're not in Rome, do as Rome. And, and Patrick said, no, we, we've, we've got to 
build right alongside the communities where we're at. Um, I, some of the things that uh, uh, I think we need to do is move away from being uh, to find our identity and our size. I'm kind of tired of hearing about how small we are in the Church of Lutheran Brethren. Uh, I think why emphasize that? I think we should emphasize we have a great God and a great gospel and speak uh, positively of the gospel and not find our identity in, in uh, how many churches we are or what size we are. I, I think that's part of a theology of glory where, we, where we, we esteem ourselves by a number rather than by the power of the gospel. And so I'd, I'd like to a- encourage us to you know, live in the greatness of God and the gospel, not, not in some human measurement. One of the questions that I had was, if you can speak to what the Fifth Act is and their plans, it's a group of about seven or eight young uh, church leaders, pastors out on the eastern seaboard who have a vision for planting Lutheran Brethren churches in urban settings. They're not church planters themselves. They're kind of a clearinghouse or an advocacy group for Lutheran Brethren churches being planted. When we went through our church reorganization about five or six years ago, we admitted that our old method of planting churches, which was really a top-down hierarchical approach where we identified a community where growth was happening and we kind of parachute dropped in. It was called a cold plant. We just put in a church planter with a half a million dollars or whatever it was and go and knock on doors. And and that worked in more of a Christendom setting, but in post-Christendom we believe that there's got to be more of an organic ownership and vision locally where people say we've got people here who have a heart for the gospel and they want to plant a church, and church is coming together locally. So it's more of a grassroots. And the fifth act is one of those representations. And right now we've got 10 to 12 different places in the Lutheran Brethren where either churches are ready to plant a daughter church, or they're wanting to plant uh, a church via a cluster, or there's a church from another group wanting to come in. The fifth act is one whose vision is to plant Lutheran Brethren churches in urban centers. And I think we're about two weeks away from naming our first church planter and where the location of that will be. So it's pretty exciting. The financing for that church plant, this is kind of cool. We have a vision called Lifting Our Eyes, which is a $20 million ministry advancement. Probably Joel Eggy was here to talk about it. For the next five years, 15 of that is for our normal operating ministry budget, the Church of Lutheran Brethren. The five million is split in between uh, sending four international missionaries to Chad, three to Chad, one to Taiwan, five church plants once a year for the next five years and about $500,000 for our seminary to advance lay leader training, training for elders, Sunday school teachers, youth workers, uh, et cetera. We're excited about all of that, but this would be the first church plant under this Lifting Our Eyes initiative. And the financing for this church will be only about one-third of it will come via the Lutheran Brethren Lifting Our Eyes advancement. One-third of it will be the church planter themselves raising funds as a missionary, and one-third of it, Tim Keller's City to City Redeemer, not a non-Lutheran group, is going to help fund our church plant, if in, which is a remarkable thing, if in our church plant we set aside, we tithe into a fund that goes for the next church plant. So pretty, pretty exciting time that way. Uh, other hot topics in the CLBA, I'm going to scare you here, but I'm just going to list them off. And then you can email me or call me and say, what in the world were you talking about uh, there? But these are some things I think we've got to face. Uh, One, I think we have in post-Christendom an increasing number of our churches that really struggle to be able to afford a full-time pastor. The benefit and salary package to maintain a full-time pastor for a lot of our really small rural churches now is unattainable. And so we've got to learn, we've got to train pastors who are ready to be bivocational or tent-making pastors. Starting in seminary, we need to start to train people that this not even is a negative, this can be a ministry advantage. You may be called to be a bivocational or a tent-making pastor because I, I don't know what percentage, but I would say right now at least 10%, if not 15% of our churches are going to struggle to be able to maintain the financial package of having a full-time pastor. That happens with an underground church. That happens with churches that are doing mission from the fringe. We're not used to that. We need to get ready for that. Second thing I would say is I think we need to do way uh, better than what we've done, confirmation class, and how we welcome the next generations up to take leadership in the church. We say we want that, and usually it takes flesh 
in worship wars over what kind of music we have, and I think that's the least issue on it. It's how do we raise up leaders in the church to not be consumers, but that we're not about entertaining our kids, but to really own the mission and, and carry it on. The older generations, we have to do a better job of opening the door for the younger generations to be raised up to become leaders of, of, of the church. And uh, I, you know, I think some churches are doing great that way. I love the scripture, the prophecy that says, old men will dream dreams, young men will see visions. There's a reason that says, you know, we need each other. We, we need each other. We need the stability of age. We need the inexhaustible vision of young people that don't know why you can't. When I was 20, I was ready to drop everything and go to Africa and do whatever. You know, it's harder to do that when you've got five kids and a mortgage. You know, we, we need each other's generations, both dreams and, and visions to come together. Uh, a third thing I'd say is I think we need to explore more the full utilization of all the gifts, the spiritual gifts of women in our congregation to the full extent that our theology allows. I'm not proposing any change of ordination than we have. I just think we have to be more sincere and say, what are all the gifts that our women in our churches have, not just in our homes, but in business, in the community, with wisdom, and, and say, are we fully utilizing the gifts of our women? They're not on our elder boards, but how are they informing and showing us uh, and informing the, the vision that we have for, uh, for, for ministry? I think we need to delve deeper uh, into that, not to keep peace with our leading women, it's just that the church isn't getting the full advantage of the gifts that it has unless we move in that direction. Uh, I have a personal opinion that uh, the injunction of uh, elders must be the husband of one wife. Boy, I'm really going for it here. I'll just get myself in big trouble. I, I believe that is speaking about polygamy in that culture and not about someone who has a divorced background but is living in the gospel at this time. And we have nothing actually written on our LB books that a person who has divorced in their history but is now living in grace can't be an elder or a pastor. It's just been practiced that way out of habit, and we, we are in the middle. We have to study that and say, is that, is that right? Is that really where we should be? You know, there's a time for the church to have a prophetic voice that says, you know, this is, uh, if we open this door, it's going to give, open up these other doors. But there's also a time for a redemptive voice. And I where, where we see people who've been through hard situations come fully into the gospel and forgiveness and to see people in leadership that way, I, I think we need to re-examine that in the Lutheran Brethren and be honest with, uh, with what we believe Scripture says and have, have a policy and encouragement in keeping with that. I, I, I'm not going to project that my answer is about, I just think we have to, we have to face it and pursue it. Um, I think we can't be afraid of critical issues. Uh, in our culture, and so uh, our young people in schools and in our workplaces are dealing with all kinds of social issues of sexuality, of marriage, of family, uh, of environment. Uh, we preach law gospel sermons in our churches, and I think we need to continue to do that, but we need to be able to address current issues in ways that are treated in a law gospel approach uh, to that and not hide uh, from those issues in, in the church. Um, let's see, last couple questions here. You can talk about what our regional convention is and what our national convention is. Every other year we have a national convention. Every other year we have a regional convention. A regional convention for the central region is this summer in Trago, Wisconsin. Um, and I believe our conventions are basically about two things. They're about ownership and they're about equipping and uh, on the first one uh, uh, ownership I think our conventions are there to say the ministry belongs to you you are the owners of this mission you elect leaders you set budgets you shape the the overall leadership structure to make decisions for the Church of Lutheran Brethren so that the regional conventions are for ownership but it's also for about for equipping and the regional conventions are times where we come together and there's a sense of reunion there's a time of rejuvenation there's a resources are being shared and there's a refocus on mission kind of like that time we come together at a, at a family reunion and we say ah it's good to be us it's good to remember who we are and so those conventions are, are, are both for the ownership of the mission and, and really the rejuvenation of the body together uh, if you could help 
people understand our autonomous church government structure, how we function less like a denomination, more like an association? I can answer that very quickly, and I think I maybe alluded to it before. In the Lutheran Brethren, we are a low church form of government that means that the synod holds a relationship with the congregations based around a common statement of faith. And the pastors are accountable and encouraged to the, to the denomination by their ordination and agreement to operate within the, the promises of that uh, ordination. When you take on a new pastor and he's installed, he's going to stand up here and make vows to you of the kind of pastor he's going to be according to his ordination and the minister of the gospel handbook. And you all are going to be asked the question, so will you pray for, love, and support this pastor in this role as he serves? And you're probably all going to nod your head and say yes. I think it'd be good about every three to five years for churches to revisit their vows, like vow renewals in a marriage. We should come back and remember what we have vowed to be as pastors and congregation to each other. Uh, and then I think the last update on Pastor Eggie's visit last year in which he shared about the future hopes, that's this lifting our eyes. Uh, I already mentioned it, four international missionaries, five church plants, and distance learning. We've made the, ma the most, uh, of the five million additional, we've got pledged close to, not quite one yet, I think it's about 800,000. Uh, not hit the road yet, that'll be on me, largely, to be out there uh, in that capacity. Uh, but the main focus right now has been on church planting. Uh, Matt Rognes, our international mission director, is visiting with a couple to go over and be the new uh, uh, residents of the, uh, of the guest center in Jemina Chad. Uh, the seminary is working on a model for distance learning. So we're advancing on all three fronts, but the most obvious one right now is in church planting. Um, if you could speak to how the CLBA seeks to partner and help the local church. Uh, talk about how headquarters will help a church call as it calls its pastor. I think we talked, I talked about that uh, in the beginning, but I think a key way that we serve you is through your regional pastor, and uh, you don't have one right now, uh, but I am very hopeful, you know, this short of being able to say, I promise you, you'll have one by the end of the summer, but I really believe you will. Up until that time, Matt Rognes, myself, others in the denominational headquarters are happy to be a uh, an advocate and a resource uh, uh, for you, but we want, we want to get you your re regional pastor back uh, a as soon as possible. We want to see you empowered to think about your mission to Lesur, but also be a catalyst for you to dream about how you can see Lutheran Brethren churches planted, uh, maybe together with other churches in your region. So that's, uh, that's the questions that I, that I had. Any follow-up ones? I think our, our hour's done. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think we're about ten short pulpits right now. We have about ten openings uh, to not cover. Some of those are being covered though by uh, licensed lay pastors. So they're they're men who have not had full seminary training but they have a life of experience in ministry as an, as an elder or parachurch ministry. And that's one of the reasons why the distance learning from the seminary is so important that we can help to bring these guys along as pastors with supplemental education. And it probably also fits what I was saying about the number of churches that can't afford a full-time pastor. Some of the reasons the openings are there is they don't have really the capacity to call a full-time guy. And we're not, we're not producing guys coming out of seminary who are really ready to think about, oh, I could be in a bivocational ministry, or even that's what they are looking for. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we have about 10 openings. Okay, Mark, you want to shut this down? Sure. I encourage you guys. I mean, Paul is an awesome resource. We've been in conversation with Paul for quite a while now, but uh, you... Feel free to get a hold of him with any questions. Feel free to, as you hear him talk about call committee process, talk to myself or any of the elders. Uh, we are meeting every two weeks, and we would love to talk with you about that too. Um, pray for Pastor Ed and Tanya and the kids. They're driving to Minot right now, and they close on their house in Minot tomorrow, or the, they start the paperwork for it. And uh, pray for their house here that they would be able to sell that as soon as they can too. So would you pray for us? Absolutely. 
Uh, Lord, uh, Word of Life is your bride. Um, and, and I just pause and, and am humbled and joyful to think of the love that you have poured out on and, and for this, this congregation. Uh, Lord, as the bride of Christ, this is the most precious thing that you have in the universe. You have shed your son's blood for this church. And, and I think of what <clears throat> you moved your prophet John the Baptist to say of uh, that he must become lesser and you must become greater, that he saw himself as a, a groomsman uh, to the groom coming for his bride. And, and I pray for the leaders of Word of Life that they would have that kind of regard for uh, your bride, the, the church, that they are our groomsmen uh, serving the, the groom, attending a, a wedding, knowing that you have, have come as a groom to take a people unto yourself, to prepare them and dress them in white, to dress them in your own holiness. Uh, and, and God, we, we have two views of the church. We have what you have said of the church, and that is she is your bride, she's your wife, she's dressed white, she's been made pure. It's the same word as, as you have said to us of our justification. You have washed us clean and white. And then we have this other view of the church, of something that's weak and, and fragile. We have this view of ourselves, knowing we still struggle with sin. We, we see the bride of Christ as, as some, some lady that's, that's frail and old and, and, and has warts. And, and we see that side of her, and we struggle with, with both realities. I pray for these people that they first of all, would move on with the confidence of knowing themselves to be the precious bride of Christ. That they'd be honest about the places they need to grow, but know that they have been covered. That they are forgiven, that they are whole in Christ, that they themselves, even as leaders, are part of that bride of Christ that you love so much. I pray for them in their search process for a pastor, that you guide them to someone who is being sent to them. That, that it's, it's not that they will so much need to depart as they are being sent in, in mission to this place and that you will advance your kingdom in this community through word of life, that your kingdom would come to this congregation, that your kingdom would come through this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks all for being here. Yeah.